Welcome to Whiskey Cast, Cask Strength Conversation, featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 927 for February 20th, 2022. Coming up in a few minutes. But it just seems like yesterday. It's quite scary to think about it. But when I look back at what we've achieved, and especially the products, it kind of creeps up in you because you just keep making whiskey it, it never stops it's just this 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 thing you just you always keep doing it's been 24 years since gordon and mcphail restarted production at Speyside's historic ben rummick distillery in forest scotland distillery manager keith krugshank has been there for all of those years while richard urquhart was still a teenager now he's working his way up through the ranks of his family's company Keith and Richard will both join us later on Whiskey Cast in Depth. That's just ahead, along with the What I'm Tasting This Week department, your voice behind the label, and... We would stop whiskey production and then invite the two governments to Stowning to start the peace negotiations. That is, that is our, our thinking behind it. The news is next on this week's Whiskey Cast. And now, a message from Robin Redbreast. Trying to fit the best of Ireland into one day, huh? Hmm. Good luck. Takes us at least 12 years. Happy St. Patrick's Day from Redbreast. Proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. Drew's brand ambassador, Gabriel Cartarella again. Let's talk about some of the oldest whiskies in our range of premium scotch. Jewers 18 years, one of my favorites. A sipping whiskey with a long, sweet finish, a must try. Dewar's 25 year is the oldest and rarest whiskey in our permanent range. It's finished and double aged in the finest Oloroso sherry casks from our Royal Bracla single malt distillery. Let's get started with the news. It's brought to you by the Dalmore. Campbellton could soon have its first new whiskey distillery in more than a century. R&B Distillers has acquired a farm in the area and will be seeking planning permission to build the Macrahanish Distillery starting next year. R&B owns the Isle of Rassi Distillery. Co-founder Bill Dobby's family comes from the Campbellton area. Meanwhile, just as the Winter Olympics are winding down in Beijing, there's been a groundbreaking ceremony for a new Chinese whiskey distillery. The ceremony was held Friday at the site of the Nine Rivers Distillery in southern China. On an auspicious day for followers of Feng Shui, it was the Day of the Four Water Tigers on the Chinese astrological calendar, a day that only happens once every 60 years. MGP has started work on a new $12 million maturation warehouse project in northern Kentucky, The project in Williamstown is located about an hour south of the company's flagship distillery in Lawrenceburg, Indiana. Work is expected to be completed by the end of this year. In other news, here's a story on an update we've reported on several times over the last nine years. The Scotch Whiskey Association has won its battle with a German distillery over the use of the word Glen in its whiskies. Waldhorn Distillery has lost its final appeal in the German and European courts and will have to remove the offending word from its Glen Buchenbach whiskey. The SWA routinely goes after any whiskey maker outside of Scotland that uses the word Glen in its labeling, or for that matter, anything that implies Scottish heritage and might confuse consumers into thinking that they're getting a Scotch whiskey. Now, this is especially important right now because of the SWA's fight in Canada against Macaloni's Caledonian Distillery in British Columbia. As we reported earlier this month, the SWA has threatened Graham Macaloni's German importer with legal action unless they stop selling Macaloni's whiskies in Germany. The rulings in the Glenn Buchenbach case could provide a legal precedent in that dispute, as well as future cases in Europe involving non-Scottish whiskies. That's even though the SWA lost another long legal fight years ago in Canada with Glenora Distillers. Canada's Supreme Court ruled back then that Glenora's Glen Breton whiskies do not conflict with Scottish indications of origin. From the Crime and Punishment Department now, 
Police in Calgary, Alberta, are still trying to find the person who drove a truck through the front door of the Kensington Wine Market on February 11th. The truck shattered the entire entrance. The thief took off with several bottles of whiskey. The store is open again following temporary repairs, but it'll be several months before work is completed. Meanwhile, police in Scotland are still looking for suspects in the theft of thousands of dollars worth of whiskey from Aberlour's Visitor's Center. The break-in happened over the distillery's winter break, but the press and journal reports that the stolen whiskey came from a batch that has not yet gone on sale to the public, and that might make the bottles easier to trace. Finally, a Japanese man is in jail after he was accused of stealing 170 bottles of whiskey from the house he had been hired to renovate. The owner discovered the theft when he returned from overseas and checked his whiskey cabinet. According to Vice, the thief replaced flasks of whiskey stored in their boxes with bottles of sparkling water. Police started checking online sites and stores to see if the suspect had been selling whiskey, and of course he had been. The victim still has yet to recover any of that stolen whiskey, though. Meanwhile, lots of distilleries have on-site restaurants, but only one distillery has a Michelin-starred restaurant. The Glen Turret's new Lalique restaurant was awarded a Michelin star just seven months after it opened under the leadership of Chef Mark Donald. He had previously led the Balmoral's number one restaurant when it earned a Michelin star. And last but not least, you know the name Louisville Slugger probably best from baseball, where its bats have been a mainstay for generations. But what you might not know is that the family's business actually started with making bourbon barrels in Louisville. J. Frederick Hillerich started the business, but his son Bud switched over to making baseball bats instead of barrels. Now, Hillerich and Bradsby is opening a bourbon blending experience next to the Louisville Slugger Museum on Louisville's Whiskey Row downtown. Visitors will get to blend a bourbon to their personal taste and then have it bottled to take home. The place is being called Bourbon and Billets. The name comes from the blank pieces of wood called billets that are turned on a lathe to make baseball or softball bats. You can keep up with the latest whiskey news all week long on our social media timelines and at whiskeycast.com. The news is brought to you by the Dalmore. Hello, Richard Patterson here, master distiller, master blender for the Dalmore. You know, whenever the team and I are in the world sharing our exceptional single malt, we like to keep in touch with Mark Gillespie and the latest news from Whiskey Cast. If you missed Friday night's Happy Hour live webcast with Lance Winters and Dave Smith from California's St. George Spirits, the on demand replay is available now at the Whiskey Cast YouTube channel. And we'll have a podcast version out later this week. This Friday night, I'll be joined by Dr. Don Livermore from the Hiram Walker Distillery in Windsor, Ontario. The fun starts at 5 p.m. New York time on the WhiskeyCast YouTube channel, our Facebook page, Twitter, and Twitch. Time now for the Whiskey Cast calendar of events brought to you by Catoctin Creek Distilling. First off, we have new dates now for Dramfest 2022 in Christchurch, New Zealand. As I reported a couple of weeks ago, it's being postponed because of local health restrictions that are still in place. The folks at Whiskey Galore have decided to hold off until next March, the weekend of March 4th and 5th, 2023. However, the local restrictions will allow for some smaller tastings this coming weekend at Whiskey Galore. The Silver Lining sessions are set for this Friday and Saturday. Elsewhere, the Newcastle Whiskey Festival is this Saturday in Newcastle, England. The Fife Whiskey Festival is March 4th through the 6th in Scotland. The Romo Whiskey Festival is the 4th and 5th of March in Rome, Italy. Bourbon's Bistro in Louisville, Kentucky hosts a New Riff Bourbon Dinner March 9th. Whiskey and Barrel Night is in New York City on the 10th. And the rescheduled Edel Dropper Festival is March 12th in Stavanger, Norway. Remember, all in-person events are still subject to change on short notice. 
And you probably will have to show proof of vaccination or a recent negative COVID test in order to attend. The calendar of events is brought to you by Catoctin Creek Distilling, makers of the Virginia Rye Whiskey. You'll find their Roundstone Rye at fine whiskey shops in 26 U.S. states, three continents, and online. Visit the new buyvirginiarye.com site for more details. And please drink responsibly. If it's chocolate you're craving this Valentine's Day, then look no further than Jewers 18 and Jewers 25-year aged marks. Indulgent, yeah, but you are totally worth it. This Scotch whiskey's unique taste experience is one of the world's most popular and awarded whiskeys. Our flagship award winner, Jewers 18-year-old, is everyday luxury. A superbly crafted whiskey. The signature 25-year-old is something very special. Comprised of fine and rare Scotch whiskeys from the Jewers inventory and aged in hand-selected casks for at least a quarter century, it's for those looking to push the boat out and celebrate milestones and to have an approachable luxury whiskey in their home, office, or whiskey cabinet that they can pour for those dearest and nearest when the time is right. Whatever type of whiskey you enjoy, these two will have you asking for seconds. Whiskey Cast in Depth is brought to you by Mortlock and the Classic Malts lineup. Back in 1998, the whiskey boom had not quite yet taken hold, so the reopening of long close to distilleries was extremely rare. Five years earlier, Gordon and McPhail had acquired the old Ben Romick distillery in Forest and spent the time rebuilding the distillery a piece at a time. When they finally finished the restoration project, the concept of reviving old distilleries was so unheard of that Prince Charles himself came to the official reopening. Now, the modern-day Ben Romick team is getting ready to celebrate the 25th anniversary of that rebirth next year, just as Gordon and MacPhail prepares to open its second distillery, the Cairn, in the coming weeks. I spent some time on a Zoom call this week with longtime Ben Romick manager Keith Kreikshank and Richard Urquhart of Gordon and McPhail. It's hard to believe it's been 24 years since the distillery reopened. Yeah, I was a, a young man, and so was Keith back then when it opened. Yeah. <laughs> you were a very young man back then, Richard, you know? So, I wasn't even old enough to even enjoy whiskey at that point. I was 17 years old. Yeah. I remember Richard and Stuart at the official reopening. They were just boys, loons, as I call them, you know? The whole family was there. I just remember the day very well, you know. So, but it just seems like yesterday. It's quite scary to think about it. But when I look back at what we've achieved, and especially the products, it kind of creeps up in you because you just keep making whiskey. It, it never stops. It's just this, 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 this thing you just you always keep doing. It's never, it's never really an end game, like really, you know. Um, and then the products just. Well, the 10 came out, it was great. And then with the 15, it was like, oh, this is... Then and then the 21 crept up, and I'm thinking, oh, my God. You know, and I imagine there'll be a, an older sibling somewhere down the track as well at some point, like, you know? So, yeah, the family's coming together, if you know what I mean. I always think of it like that. that it's, it's, I guess it's slightly different for me because I'm in a u- unique position of being there for the start, and I get all the... When they think about normal, they always think it's Keith, it's Keith, and it's quite, you know, it's it, it's not about Keith. It never can be, can it? But I was just lucky to be there at the start and had the pleasure and the privilege to to see what we've achieved, So, which is very rare. I would never get that. And there's very few distillery managers ever get that, you know. I mean, there's a lot of new opportunities now for new distilleries and such like. But I've done 24 years of a shift, so I'm, I've got the pleasure of seeing all the products, and that's a great thing. You know, we've got warehouses full of beautiful whiskies that, that are and will be coming out as well. So, yeah, yeah, it's great. It's it's the it beats working for a living. That's what I see. <laughs> Richard, has this yeah, turned out to be everything you thought it would be when uh, the place started up in 1998? Well, I, I think the kind of honest answer is I didn't really know much about whiskey back in 1998. I knew we were building a distillery or reopening a distillery. I knew we were, um, that was going to be a big part of our future. But it's probably when I came back to business kind of about 12 years ago to really see how the business was evolving at that point. 
to go from a UK wholesale business to former for a whiskey business being the fourth one. And now seeing Bonoma coming through, it's just amazing. I mean, I always like to refer to it as my grandfather's dream that we'd actually make whiskey. And actually seeing that come to where it is now is just it's just amazing. I think he'd be and very happy with where we've got to and where we're going. I think you're right there, Richard. I, I didn't know Richard's grandfather very well, but I remember the early days when we started to still up. Um, when we run the stills, just the spirit still, for the first time. And there wasn't really any ceremony because Richard's family are not like that. Um, they're quite reserved and quiet, and you know them. Um, and there was Richard's grandfather, and Richard's father was there, and his, his uncles. And, so the third gen, second and third generation were there. That'd be right. Um, just for the distillation, the first cut that came off, and it was just a lovely. They sat um, Richard's grandfather down, Mister George, is formerly called beside the spirit safe. And we just took the spirit off. We gave it a good 10 minutes in the spirit room to be sampled and gave um, Mr. George the, the first nose and the first taste of New make spirit. So, and I think I remember Rosemary, it was quite an emotional time for Rosemary, I think, and everybody, because that's what, as Richard said, that's what the grandfather's dream was to distill a Speyside style of whiskey. Um, and that's what we did back in 98. And, and the company's just went the the brands went from strength to strength and the company as well. So yeah, it was it's quite I always speak formally of the family and everything because it's, you know, I go back quite a bit as well, even though I think I'm a new start, you know. Um, but yeah, it's um, it's been good. It's been really good. Thoroughly enjoyed it. How has the place changed over the years, over that uh, two dozen years? Well, it's changed quite a lot. Fundamentally, the, the, the core of the distillery hasn't changed. So the way we make whiskey hasn't changed since the day I, we started. Um, that fundamental whiskey-making methods hasn't changed. And when I look back at modern distilleries and the new equipment that's made, it's, it's, we have stuck with what we've done and the quality of the spirit has always been at the forefront. Absolutely. But we have had to increase production and we've had to build more warehouses to hold the maturing stock because obviously quite a lot of the Ben Romick stock is aged for 10 years plus. So we need a lot more and we need to look at the markets, the emerging markets that we have. So we chose to increase production 2013 and 2017 and we had to have warehousing capacity for that. So the biggest change at the site, without a doubt, has been the warehouse capacity. But the distillery itself, it looks the same as it was when I started back in 98. We've got the same. We have got more washbacks, but the core of the distillery, we've still got two wash, the, the one pair of still, same mash down and such like. So that hasn't really changed all that much. And the way we make it hasn't changed. I'm very, I'm very conscious of that in this era of, of heat recovery and, and economy and efficiencies and everything. It's great. You have to look at that and you've got to look at the environment and efficiency and everything. But the driving force for me is making sure that the, the spirit is consistent. It has to be. So what we make today in 10 years' time when Richard goes to sell it in the States or wherever, it has the same character. It has the same quality. And every distillery manager will have that same ethos. They're all... You know, we can all be quite quirky in the way we do things, but it's that it's that quirkiness and that 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 makes some of these unique, iconic distilleries in the way they are. You know, so and for me, I think Ben Romick is. I've always thought that it's it's quite an iconic, unique distillery in its character and the style. You know, um, to bring back a an old space eye character because it was such a I say it's a brave thing to do, but it's you know back then space side was space side. It wasn't what we brought reintroduced or brought back, you know. So we look back in the the stocks that we had of the style of space side. God my fail had that. And we are how, how what do you mean by space an old space side card? What are you speaking about? But we can, it's not lip service, we can absolutely demonstrate what we mean. 
Gordon McPhail have bottled single malts from pre-war, from decades of different. They were doing single malts before MDLs. Small batch, and they were doing 8, 10, 12 euro whiskies from all the beautiful space, like, right in the 50s and 60s as 10, 12, 15 year old whiskies. Now, we actually had the samples from that era. Okay, they were old samples. They were old samples. But we could look back and see what that 12 and 50 year old whiskies were like in character from the, the, the beautiful space sites that, that, that you would associate the Mortlis and the Sathilas and the Glen Lewis and the Glen Grants and the Linkwoods, the true big space site hitters, you know? And it's that character that we chose. We could see the character coming through and we chose that, that, that lovely sherry. But most importantly was the, we had to get that, that elegant smokiness back into the, the space I carved. And that's what we did. That's why 12 ppm is, is our standard. And that is the space I character that we chose to reintroduce. And it is, it's, it's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful when it's, especially with sherry cast and such, like even bourbon as well. And that's where you get the 10, the 15, the car strength, and the 21 year old. There's that link of character all the way through. And you've also got the, the core Ben Romick styles, the spiciness, the maltiness, the fruitiness, you know, comes through there. I think a lot of people forget that Speyside whiskies used to be peated back in the day. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, back in the 50s and 60s, there wasn't really a Speyside character that you'd call Speyside. There was just whiskey made on this was Highland, really, wasn't it? Rather than Speyside. But yes, there would have been quite distinctive, very rich character coming through. A lot of them had worm tubs as well. So there was a, a full bodied heaviness. If anything, whiskies over the last 20, 30 years, a lot of the criticism have been that they've gotten lighter, very sweet, you know? And a lot of the flavours have kind of come together, whereas, you know, 20, 30 years ago, sometimes they would say there was more iconic whiskies out there. They were full-bodied, they were rich, they were really distinct in the DNA and the character that came through. So, and that's one of the things that we've got at Ben Roman, because they're very distinct you could pick a Ben Romick out from 20 space sides easy. I suppose the peatiness does help, like I would say, like, you know, but it's very distinctive in its character as well. It's very rich, it's very moorish, it's very uh, like an old style whiskey. It's hard to describe it any other way, you know, but it's, uh, as you can know, I mean, I'm passionate about the whiskey, especially my own whiskey and other whiskeys. I, I love quite a, a lot of different styles of whiskeys, you know, but yeah, it's um, the product has to be. Fast class, and that's something that Gordon and Fion have always done, and they haven't changed anything like that at Ben Romick. I get the finest quality cast to mature in, the finest quality cast, fast love cast from Sherry, best quality cast. Never get leakers because they're absolutely the best quality cast, ex and internally, and the barman cast as well. So, which is great for installing monster to be able to do that, to be able to fill the cast into fast love cast, you know. So, um, yeah, the quality of spirit has to be paramount for any distillery manager. The 2013 expansion that you referred to, Keith, Richard, those whiskies are going to be coming online in the next uh, year or two, I would assume. Will that let you increase uh, distribution worldwide? Um, yeah, we do have a, a window coming up um, in the next couple of years where we can start to grow our sales. Um, we are capped by what we failed many years ago. So as we get access to more stock, it does give us the opportunity to look for more markets and invest in the key markets to get um, bigger volumes coming through. So a lot of the work right now uh, laying the foundation for that increase in stock coming through. What markets do you plan to focus on? For myself, um, the US is going to be a primary focus in the coming years. It is the largest um, kind of spirits market, I guess, for, by value in the world. Um, there's lots of people in the US who love Scotch whiskey and, and we want to take our whiskey there, but we'll have a spread of business coming through uh, the US, Asia, Europe, and some more traditional markets as well. We are still going to be very, very small in the scheme of Scotch whiskey. So for us, it's not about massive volumes. It's staying true to those kind of values around quality and making sure that authenticity on the brand, but making sure we can make it as available as we can with the amount of stock that we have to sell. 
Earlier this month, you released a brand new expression, the uh, Kara Gold Single Malt. Tell me about that one. Yeah, so Keith, I'll pass that one on to you since you actually made that one. And you can talk about the, the barley variety. Yeah, the, um, the Kara Malt or Kara Gold Malt, as it's called, many years ago, I think it was 2010, such a long time ago, we uh, at Ben Roman, because we're still a, quite a small distillery, we had the opportunity to to try different things out, you know, obviously within what we were legally allowed to do. So one of the things we did try myself and the now managing director, he was um, the production director at that time, we chose to look at introducing some caragol malt, a caramalt we call it. And the caramalt was a caragol malt, is a, it's a roasted malt. So it's toasted to high temperature and that caramelizes the, the starches into lovely soluble sugars. And we introduced that into a standard Ben Roma pot still malt. But it was a reasonably modest inclusion rate. So we, we did we didn't do it separately by himself because we wanted to have still retain that Ben Roma DNA character, but include some of this because we thought it'd be nice and interesting to try some of this roasted malt, not just roasted malt by itself, you know, because we wanted to make sure that the, the flavours were balanced between what is standard core Ben Romick and also the Cara Gold Malt. So we did these batches. We did one week, um, very small batch to say the least. We have only done it once. So this is a one-off batch. Uh, we might do it again, but you have to you know, wait another 10 years before we do it. So there's a one-off batch. So it was very interesting. Uh, it's not really about the barley variety because it's a roasted malt. So typical to be a beer malt, it will have that inclusion of flavour. That's what's all about. It's not about the starch, it's about the, the flavour from the roasted malt. So caramel, toasted, sugary, sweet. That's that's the typical flavours you should get from it. And typically, in the, we matured it in uh, fast film American bourbon casts. Just allow that that sort of delicacy to come through if there was delicacy. We chose not to do it in sherry cask because maybe if there was that subtlety, the sherry cask might overpower that subtlety coming through. So we chose to do it in an American uh, barbecue cask. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a fantastic whiskey and you can get that, that lovely um, sort of caramel notes coming through, you know. I mean, you get that sweet toffee notes anyway, Ben Roman, vanilla, which you're gonna you're gonna get that. But yeah, there's quite a prominence on the the caramel note, as I would I would call it. So yeah, we did that as a one-off match. So I actually forgot we actually did it. Quite honest with you, we've done quite a lot in the past, you know. And uh, but we we kind of just looked through the archives and Mark, Mark looks at it as well. But yeah, myself and and our manager director, we did that many years ago. So. If it works or doesn't work, you can you can take the blame for it. <laughs> but it does work. It's a fantastic whiskey you get. So with very, very small batch and up to now it was just a one-off we did with that. So yeah, and it does um it's not about the barley variety, it's about the, the, the roastedness, which will give uh an effect into the overall character as well. Yeah. So yeah, we're quite proud of it. So yeah, it's a a nice, a nice add to the contrast range. So, how many more of these experiments do you have floating around in the warehouse? I couldn't tell you that. Mark. I couldn't tell you that. They, they, <laughs> they, they, I'm sworn to secrecy with them. Trouble is, you know, they, they, you know, I'm definitely sworn to secrecy. Marketing team are very, you know, they oh, no, please don't let Keith go live on what. <laughs> no, we've, we, I mean, yeah, we, we did things. Yeah, some good things, some things, and, and we'll only ever release it if we feel that it has, it says something. It's got value. It has an impact and flavor. We don't do it just to be trendy or, or, or whatever, you know. It has to have a flavor impact and be interesting uh, within what we're allowed to do uh, as a Scots whiskey producer. So, yeah, we've, we've done a few things over the past, but the core style is our driving force. It's all about the core style. The contrast styles are great. Fantastic, they're interesting, they're, they're a pleasure to do, but they're there to support the core style because that is 
the Ben Rumor, if that's what Ben Rumor represent as a house style. So, but yeah, the caramel is um, it's good. It's great to do them as twelve years ago. We did it now, so wow. Well, yeah, there'll be a few more. Of them. So what do you do with the experiments that don't work out? It's not like you have a blended <laughs> malt or a blended scotch that you can blend these things away into. Mark, you're asking really difficult questions. <laughs> I'm just curious because uh, they don't always no, work. What do you, so what, you, you can't just – it would be a shame just to dump them. Yeah, we don't really dump them. I mean, most of what we done, have done, we believe, will have an impact of flavor. We can release them. At some point, sometimes we can do small cast releases to specific markets and depending on, we have BVs, the visitor center, we have single cast releases. So, um, yeah, yeah, there is a lot. We would never, ever dump them because they're fantastic whiskies. They're never not good. They're always good. But, you know, sometimes they just, they, 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 they maybe don't really um, stand out apart from the, the standard. So, but yeah, we haven't done anything weird or wacky or anything like that. But yeah, some of the things we've done we should be interested in we can release. Uh, but yeah, the, the caramel being a good um a good description of, of, of what we some of some of the innovation we've we've tried over the the last twenty four years, you know. So innovate to a certain extent, you know, there's only so much you can't do, but you have to make it interesting, you know, to support the brand. So but yeah, no, we don't dump any whiskey. No, Mark, we do that. That would be crazy. That would be insanity, wouldn't it? Really? That would be a waste. It would be a waste. Yeah, yeah. But we will have a home for that whiskey. Absolutely, absolutely. Richard, let me pose this one to you. After twenty-four years, let's look ahead twenty-four years in the future, when you will be at retirement age, if I do my calculations correctly. What do you hope Ben Romick will be in 24 years from now? So for us, it's all about, there's different ways to look at it um, from different different aspects. So for Ben Romick itself, really wanting to be a successful single more brand, still staying true to those kind of quality and where I'm from in terms of making sure it's the best quality whiskey, which I'm sure I know we would do. And it's becoming a bigger part of our overall business. So for us, investing in Ben Womack for the next 24 years is trying to take the pressure off Go McPhail as a business in terms of it being about Go McPhail. Ben Womack will then become a much bigger part of what we do um, around the world. And then it's like watching something grow up, um, a child, and see it actually become and really it gets true identity. I think we're seeing that now with the new packaging um, coming through, going back to a little bit more of its roots in terms of the logo design and the colour of matches the distillery. But I think now we're starting to see Ben Womack really start to really find its find itself, the packaging, the story, the quality of what we're doing. So I think it's just going to be a, a real privilege to watch the distillery to continue to grow and develop over the next 24 years. How's the new distillery coming along? It's almost there. I think we're months, if not weeks, away from the first spirit coming off the stills. And, and hopefully um, myself and other members of the family and the rest of the team will get to go and see that first spirit coming off. And and I can then think back to when I was too young to really know what was happening 24 years ago and realize how big a moment it is for, for our business and our family. You're going to sit Michael down by the spirit safe like you guys uh, sat Mr. George down 24 years ago? I'm, I'm sure Michael will be there, and I'm sure he'll be um, ready to see that first spirit as well. Because I know that was sort of uh, another dream that he had was to – build a new distillery too right yeah and this decision to build a new distillery um you know on we've been working on that for a number of years it wasn't a, a rush decision so um it, the, our board of directors which is made up of our manager director and, and other um, um individuals who have industry experience who have added that to our business and the family all made that decision that we should be um um looking to see if we can actually build a second or we'll have a second distillery and build one ourselves and it's very much it is about the future because it'll be 12 years maybe before we'll have a spirit that we can sell if we wait for a 12-year-old or maybe it'll be even longer. Who knows? But for us, it's very much that's about the future. Right now, focusing on Ben Omer to get us up to um, we'll, for Ben Omer to be all it can be. And then the next generation will have, a bit like um, our generation with Ben Omer, 
next generation will probably get to see the Karen come to its um, find its feet. With the 25th anniversary coming up next year at Ben Romick, do you have any plans to uh, release a special commemorative 25 year old? I think that's one we'll, we'll discuss after um, and feed it back into the business and go, that's a really good idea, Mark. Thank you for the, for the heads up. <laughs> You've, You've discussed it. it. You just can't tell me. I get it. It's okay. It's been a very busy time um, up here with New Distillery um, relaunching the brand for months. So there'll be other, uh, there'll be many releases coming out. But yes, um, um, we'll see what happens yeah. next year. Yeah. It's highly unlikely we won't be celebrating at some point next year, anyway, you know. So, but yeah, it's, um, it seems to be a celebration every five years here at Better we can do it. So, but it's, um, yeah, it's good. The company is, you know, there's a good feel about the company at the moment. And as a company in general, especially the new distillery, what we did 24 years ago, it's coming to fruition now, or has been over the last few years. Ben Roma come out of age and the packaging and, and, and the, the core styles coming out. And the Cairn started this journey as well. So 25 years time, we'll look back. And, and this is what whiskey companies, especially farming companies, and about it's about not the short term gain; it's a long term investment for the family and also the colleagues that work within the company as well, because that's what the family does. The company does is look after the colleagues for success, for future success, and that's that's what we're doing with the the care. So they've just started their journey, but um, yeah. I'm coming to the end of my <laughs> Yeah, so but it's been great. No, I've I've still got know, quite a few years now, but I'm I'm looking at the end game now, like to a certain extent. So yeah, 24 years time, I probably won't be at the still. <laughs> yeah, we look back formally and see what we what we have achieved, which has been fantastic. By the way, Ben Romick's Visitors Center is scheduled to reopen next month for the first time since the pandemic began just in time for the Spirit of Speyside Festival at the end of April. On that note, next week we'll meet the festival's new chairman, George McNeil. Tickets for this year's festival will go on sale starting March 7th. That's Whiskey Cast in Depth. It's brought to you by Mortlock, whiskey's best kept secret. Hidden away for decades in some of the world's most famous Scotch whiskies comes a single malt inspired by an original for a fortunate few. Discover the entire Mortlock lineup at malts.com. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit. We'll start off with the Kentucky Owl St. Patrick's Day Limited Edition Bourbon. As I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, it's a blending collaboration between Kentucky Owl's John Ray and Louise McGuane of Chapelgate Whiskey in Ireland. It's bottled at 50% ABV. The nose has notes of dried flowers, caramel, apples, peaches, a hint of dark chocolate, honey, vanilla, and just a touch of mint leaves. Very complex. The taste is minty and floral at first, followed by a burst of spices with honey, vanilla, and dried fruits in the background. The finish is long, fruity, and vibrant, with lingering spices and a hint of mint leaves, and I'm scoring the Kentucky Owl St. Patrick's Day Limited Edition Bourbon a 92. I had the chance to taste the distance from Puncher's Chance Bourbon. This is a 12-year-old bourbon distilled in Tennessee. And on the label, the I and the S in distance are replaced by the number 12. It's finished in Cabernet Sauvignon wine casks and bottled at 48% ABV. The nose has touches of caramel, fresh berries, a hint of figs, soft spices, and hints of honey and vanilla in the background. The taste is fruity with berries, apricots, peaches, and a hint of figs, along with soft spices, honey, and brown sugar. The finish is long and fruity with lingering spices, and I'm scoring Puncher's Chance the Distance a 91. I'll have more tasting notes in just a minute, but first, our tasting notes are brought to you each week by Sagamore Spirit Rye Whiskey, reviving the tradition of Maryland-style rye at their Baltimore farm and waterfront distillery. 
In-person tastings are available once again at the distillery in Baltimore, but you'll also find a variety of virtual tours, tastings, and other experiences at the Sagamore Spirit website. Visit sagamorespirit.com for more details, and please drink responsibly. Heaven Hill's first edition of Elijah Craig Barrel Proof for 2022 is out now. Batch A122 is bottled at 60.4% ABV. The nose has touches of tobacco leaves, oak tannins, muted spices, and a hint of fruit. The taste starts off with cherry cola, followed by a burst of black pepper, chili powder, honey, and vanilla, along with hints of tobacco leaves and oak tannins. Adding water knocks down the spices just a bit, while opening up touches of apples, peaches, and cocoa powder. The finish, medium length with lingering spices, honey, a hint of cocoa powder, and oak. I'm scoring batch A122 of Elijah Craig Barrel Proof, a 92. And finally, let's look at the Whiskey Exchange's 13-year-old Kalila 2007 Vintage Single Cask. This one is bottled at 55.6% ABV. The nose has notes of lemongrass, heather, honey, a soft oakiness, and hints of brine and smoked salmon. The taste has a lemony tartness with a touch of pepper, a light peatiness, and hints of honey, brine, and soft oak in the background. The finish, long and tart with just a hint of peat smoke. I'm scoring the Whiskey Exchange's Kalila 2007 Vintage Single Cask, a 92. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit, I'll be adding these tasting notes to our searchable list of nearly 3,300 different whiskeys from all over the world. Check it out this week at whiskeycast.com. And now, a message from Robin Redbreast. So, in Spain, they call Redbreast Petit Rocco. It's me, but a touch more exotic. Kind of like a Redbreast PX edition. Finished in Pedro Jimenez casks, adding a velvety and decadent dimension. You know, I won't lie. A climate like this makes me wish I was a migratory bird. Proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. Redbreast. Pass it on. Let's open up the inbox now for Your Voice, presented by Scarabus, Isla Single Malt Scotch Whiskey. Got a great email the other day from longtime listener Ken Goldenberg in Orange County, California. Here's what he had to say. I have a couple of preference questions for you and want to know if they make any difference in our whiskeys. First question, cork or screw cap? Do they make any difference once the whiskey is opened and what do you prefer? For ease of use, I prefer a screw cap, as I often find it can be a bit of a struggle to get a tight-fitting cork out. Second question, it seems more and more spirits are bottled in plastic, PET, as one of their packaging options. At one time it seemed to me that that was just some Canadian brands, but now I'm seeing it in many American ones as well. And I'm not talking about the rot gut stuff, but often in the middle tier spirits, Is this because of a glass shortage, or is this just a way to cut costs both in bottling and shipping? And can it make a difference in the taste over time? Well, Ken, those are great questions. Let's start off with the cork versus screw cap question. I haven't seen that much difference over time, but to be fair, the only way to do a real test would be to have the same whiskey in both a corked bottle and one with a screw cap, to see whether there's any oxidation over time in the screw cap bottle. I will say that I have seen screw caps fail over the years if the threads get stripped on the cap. That's actually pretty easy to do if you try to tighten it too much. But then again, my cork failures have also become something of a thing, especially when they happen during a live webcast. As for plastic bottles, yep, you're seeing more of them, and it's a trend that is not going away. Not only are plastic bottles cheaper to make, but they are much cheaper to ship. In fact, we reported a couple of years ago on Jim Beam's project to start actually producing plastic bottles at one of its bottling facilities in Kentucky. The process takes PET pellets and blows them up into bottles on site, meaning that the shipping of raw materials to the bottling plant 
involves a single big box instead of pallets of glass. There is a fair question over whether the environmental impact of making that much plastic is less than the impact from making and shipping glass bottles, and there is no real consensus on that yet. Both can be recycled in theory, though. As for the impact on taste, food-grade plastic containers should have little or no impact on the taste of a whiskey long-term. I used to take empty plastic medicine bottles to whiskey shows to collect samples and still have a bunch of them in my library. Those are made from food and pharmaceutical-grade plastic, and I've never seen any impact on the samples over time, as long as the seal on the cap remains airtight. Ken, thank you again for your questions. Hope this answers them. If you have something you'd like to share with whiskey lovers around the world, you can always get in touch with us on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook at WhiskeyCast, or just email us. The address, comments at whiskeycast.com. Your voice is presented by Scarabus, the unique Isla single malt forged by the whiskey-making traditions of three generations of the Lang family. Look for it at your local Total Wine and More store in the U.S. and specialist whiskey shops worldwide. Find out more at hunterlang.com. Let's close out the show now with Behind the Label, our look at the history, science, and all those other things that make whiskey unique. It's brought to you by Writer's Tears. Last May, in episode 873, I spent this segment talking about the dispute over Hans Island. It's a small rocky place right along the border between Canada and Greenland in the North Atlantic. And that border has been the subject of a long-running but peaceful dispute between Canada and Denmark for decades. Every so often, each country will send a team to the island, take down the other country's flag and replace it with their own, and leave a bottle of liquor behind to claim sovereignty over Hans Island. The Canadians leave Canadian whiskey, of course. The Danes, aquavit. Now that tradition started long before there were whiskey distillers in Denmark, and one of the country's largest whiskey makers thinks it's time to resolve things once and for all. So much so that Stowning whiskey is threatening to stop production until the two sides reach an agreement. I talked with Stowning's Rasmus Benson via Zoom this week. We make a North American-inspired whiskey, and as the biggest Danish distillery, we don't li- like to be uh, involved or or be associated with a, a war, even though it's a gentleman war. We think that whiskey has nothing to do with the dispute between Canada and Denmark about this uh, Hans Island. And I think the, the second argument is that we find it weird that two modern peace-loving nations as Denmark and Canada has not been able to solve this problem for 90 plus years. And um, it kind of serves as a, what, what can I say, um, uh, you know, if two modern nations are not able to solve a small conflict, how can we then expect other countries to solve much more sincere problems on their behalf? So we think the symbol of Denmark and Canada not being able to agree for 90 plus years is a, a little bit uh, un, uh, unnecessary in this world where there's enough bad news with, uh, you know, uh, protest in Canada, the whole situation in Russia, Ukraine. So there's a lot of uh, stuff to disagree on. And we think it's time to put an end to this dispute of, of whiskey war between Denmark and Canada. And you're willing to stop production at Stowning to do this, right? Yeah, I think what, what we are uh, planning to do is that on World Whiskey Day, which is the 21st of March, uh, uh, yeah, March or May, I, I, I don't know right now, we would stop whiskey production and then invite the two governments to Stowning to start the peace negotiations. That is, that is our, our thinking behind it. Impressive. I figured you guys would have done this as a way to get the government in Denmark to start putting Stowning whiskey there instead of something else like schnapps or whatever they've been using for 90 years. Yeah, it could also be, but I spoke to one of the soldiers that left a bottle uh, in 78, and I said it could almost be seen as a provocation to exchange snaps with whiskey. And he laughed and he said, but nobody in Denmark made whiskey in 1798, so I guess that's why they put snaps or 
or Aquavit uh, in there instead. Uh, yeah, so um, so I think uh, you know in in all of this, of course, we realize that stowning uh, alone, stopping uh, whiskey production for a day will not make a dent in the world. So it's more the, the simple of us uh, wanting politicians, the ones who can solve this problem, to take it seriously. Because I think it was three years ago the two governments founded this uh, board that should solve the conflict between the two nations. And of course, we also realize that it's a gentleman war and it's done with kind of uh, humor and charm in a way. But but back to the two points, we don't think whiskey whiskey is taking hostage in this conflict. And and second, we, we don't think it, there should have been a conflict about a territorial dispute for so many years. And I think even as it is charming, you know, what would happen if one of the nations one day one day came and found a bottle of vodka or mezcal or champagne or anything else? Because now with the uh, climate change, the, gear, uh, the the whole region will become much more important in terms of, as I understand, sheep can do a shortcut and, and save a lot of fuel and so on. So why not solve this conflict in, you know, as, as um, lawyers say, you should make your divorce arrangement while you are married and not when you're divorced, meaning that solve the conflict before it's it's escalating into something different. We don't believe, we don't expect that it will ever be a serious problem but why don't solve it now when it's in, in good faith between two uh, peace-loving nations? Settle it with a coin flip or something like that. I think it, it, we, we don't actually care who gets what or if there's a line down the middle or it's a whole, owned half of the year or whatever the solution is. But it's more more the simple of not being able to agree to something for, for I think, it's 93 years. We think that's, that's a shame and that's too bad. Of course, there is a certain tongue-in-cheek aspect to all of this, but he does make a good point. If we can't resolve minor disputes like this one peacefully, how can we help to resolve bigger ones? Say, for instance, disputes over climate change. After we posted the entire interview with Rasmus Benson on the WhiskeyCast website, Kurt Lund pointed this out on Twitter. I believe global warming will solve this issue, the ice will melt and the small island will disappear. Case closed. Nature has a way of winning in the end. If you have something you'd like to see us look at on an upcoming episode, just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to get in touch with us. Behind the Label is brought to you by Writer's Tears. Writer's Tears Copper Pot, a rare style of Irish whiskey with a creative twist. A unique, triple distilled blend of single pot still and single malt premium Irish whiskies. Writer's Tears Copper Pot. Do you dare to be creative? That's all for this edition of Whiskey Cast. You'll find links for the stories in this episode in our show notes at whiskeycast.com. That's also where you'll find the latest whiskey news, my tasting notes, the calendar of events, cocktail recipes, the whiskey photo of the week, and much more, including a complete archive of all of our past episodes going all the way back to 2005. Get in touch with us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at WhiskeyCast. The email address, comments at WhiskeyCast.com. Dewar's 18 and Dewar's 25-year are must-try, must-add bottles to any whiskey bar collection. The care that goes into these two bottles is first class. Keep an eye out for them at your local liquor store. These two, I know you'll enjoy. And now, a message from Robin Redbreast. Small batch. How would you describe it? It's like an Irishman's understanding of baseball. Extremely limited. Proud sponsor of WhiskeyCast. Redbreast. Pass it on. Whiskey Cast is a production of Cask Strength Media, copyright 2022, and comes to you from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening, and please stay safe.